welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're honored to be joined by Professor Tom Bruns of the UC Berkeley Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. Tom's primary focus has been fungal ecology, and most of his work in this area has been at the community ecology or autoecology levels. This is a tremendously important area of work because fungi play pivotal roles in all terrestrial ecosystems, and they are grossly understudied relative to their importance. Now, Tom's accolades and list of achievements in the world of mycology probably require a podcast of their own. Along with dozens of scientific papers he has authored and co-authored, Tom has received, among many other awards, the Distinguished Teaching Award from the College of Natural Sciences, University of California, Berkeley, in 2012, the W.H. Weston Award for Teaching Excellence from the Mycological Society of America in 2007, and he has been the president of the International Mycorrhiza Society from 2015 to 2017, and the president of the Mycological Society of America from 2010 to 2011, just to name a few. I'm especially excited to talk about ectomycorrhizal fungi, those fascinating organisms that share energy and nutrients with plants in a unique symbiotic relationship. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show. Pleasure. Well, I have taken a deep dive into your work because especially this idea of mycorrhizal fungi captures so many of our imaginations when we think of this internet of the forest, the interlacing networks of fungi under the ground that are connecting all the trees. And it's something that fascinates all of us, but something, as I was telling you before the show, I only have a very nascent or very general conceptual understanding of. So I'm really excited to to dive in more. But to kick things off, just to give people a little piece of your story, I want to jump into the, the mycorrhizal fungi. Quick story of how you got into mushrooms or why you decided to pursue this path. That would take longer than we have. Uh, but I can say that as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in fungi. Like I remember as a child going around and just being fascinated by mushrooms popping up in, in yards and, and so on. It took, you know, until college years till I started to, to actually develop my interest more broadly. There was no background in my family of collecting mushrooms or anything like that. I wasn't a forager. I sort of picked that up on my own at a time when field guides were pretty awful. So, you know, I developed that side of it slowly and I would, and I would say that uh, I've never really gotten good at it. You know, I'm not, I'm not a great forager, <laughs> but I've always been fascinated by the basic biology of fungi. Like I said before, you've gotten into this incredibly interesting world of mycorrhizal fungi. So you can be a brilliant scientist studying amazing things and still not be an expert forager. <laughs> <laughs> so just to lay some just to lay some groundwork, you know, there are these big concepts that I threw out there right out the gate that I'm not sure I understand fully. So when we talk about community ecology or autoecology, what do those what do those words mean? So if you think of a big field of ecology, there's sort of a continuum from the very individual level of how species uh, make their living in, in nature. That would be sort of autoecology. And I think in some ways autoecology is is just a fancy word for natural history. So okay. it's, it's, an, it's the natural history of these organisms. And then at the, at the far end of ecology is the ecosystem level, where you're sort of understanding how all of the organisms in the environment function together to process nutrients and energy and, and so on. And at that level, oftentimes the individual organisms, nobody wants to pay any attention to. You know, that's, that's so far below that level that nobody does it. And between those two levels is, is the community level, where you're looking at the, at the interaction among organisms. So like the competition, the uh, mutualisms, what determines which species are where and what they're doing there uh, with each other. Yeah, and I like that, that you're bringing together the most... I don't want to say reductionist, but the most hyper-focused end of ecological study 
and then the most holistic general systems end of ecological study and bringing them somewhere in the middle because you're going to need knowledge from both parts to understand the natural history as you're saying of each organism and then be able to have a window into the bigger picture to say okay now how are these interacting how did this whole system maybe can we can we derive some of the natural history of this whole system based on the the organisms we're finding here and obviously fungi and mushrooms play a huge role i would guess at the community ecology level of every terrestrial system on earth we're going to focus on mycorrhizal fungi just because that's one of the most fascinating things to me so when we're looking at this community ecology level where do ectomycorrhizal or mycorrhizal fungi fit in are those words are even interchangeable like i just use them <laughs> so ectomycorrhizal fungi are, are a subset of the mycorrhizal okay. world right that like most most plants are mycorrhizal i mean you can't you know they wouldn't grow to maturity anyway with it, without a fungus attached to their roots they they have to have this interaction and they have to have this interaction because the fungi are more efficient at finding mineral nutrients in the soil for them sort of a contract where they're paying the, the fungus in sugars and the sugar is and the sugars are being used by the fungus to rustle up nutrients in the soil and so most plants are actually not ectomycorrhizal, they are arbuscular mycorrhizal or AM mycorrhizal. That's like all the grasses, most of the tropical trees, a lot of shrubs, even a lot of temperate trees are arbuscular mycorrhizal. And then ecto is a small subset. I think the current estimates are somewhere around three to 6% of plants on the planet are ecto. Oh, okay. It accounts for uh, something like 60% of the biomass of forests are ecto. So it's a, wow. so it has a, it's a very small number of plant species that are involved, but it has a huge global impact because it's associated with the, with the trees that are dominant trees, especially in the temperate forest ecosystems, so, some of the tropical ones as well. So what they lack in variety, they make up for in quantity in a big way. And when we're right. talking about arbuscular mycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal, are those definitions based on some inherent trait of the fungi, the way it feeds? Is that nomenclature developed from the trees it's associated with, or just a little bit about that difference? So it can be defined in a bunch of different ways, but I think more and more it is getting defined by the fungi involved. So the, mm. so the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are all one set one coherent set of fungi that evolved at the very origin of land plants. So if you go back to the, to the Silurian, <laughs> when, uh, when you have the very first land plant fossils in the Rhinia chair, it's already colonized by our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Oh, my, fascinating. And now that there's all these genomes done from, from plants, um, we know that the mycorrhizal genes that are involved with this symbiosis are shared by basically all land plants and there's a few examples where they've sort of lost them evolutionarily over time but what's clear is that the origin of land plants is tied directly in with the, the origin of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that is just mind-blowing to think that we wouldn't have the terrestrial plants we have today without fungi. So you can't overstate the importance of mycorrhizal fungi because they are at the heart of us having any plants. Yeah. Here. Yeah. No, it's it's easier to name the plants that are not mycorrhizal than it is to name the ones that are. And all of those that are not mycorrhizal are due to evolutionary loss. They've given them up because they're in some kind of uh, weird setting where they don't need them. But most plants need them and associate so going back to the ectos then they they show up much later in the evolutionary history they don't show up until sort of the cretaceous or jurassic border so okay. uh maybe 130 million years ago or something like that unlike the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi a bunch of different groups of fungi figured out how to be ecto so it's, it's amazingly convergent. 
I think the estimates now are that there might be 80 or more independent origins of ectomycorrhizal fungi, meaning different groups of fungi learned how to do this interaction without ha sharing a common ancestor. A mass adaptation of different fungi just, you know, when you say they became ectomycorrhizal, again, is this, they developed, how does that transition happen? I guess what I'm trying to find is this definitive break, you know, how can they develop this concurrent adaptive change? What, what did that mean? So the little bit we know about it now is that it seems like as they became ectomycorrhizal, what, what that entailed was, was losing a lot of the enzymes that break down litter and so on, so that they maintain many fewer enzymes that do things like break down cellulose or lignin, that sort of thing. So they came from saprobic ancestors, likely, uh, that had the ability to live off dead material. Yeah. Uh, and as they learned to plug into plants and get their sugars that way, they gave up many of these enzymes, although not all of them. And that ends up being important because the, the big ecological difference between ecto and AM mycorrhizal fungi is that ectos still retain some ability to break down organic matter and retrieve nutrients out of it. When I'm describing this to my classes, I always say that the classic ectomycorrhizal forest is one that when you walk into it, uh, your feet make a crunch. And it's because mm -hmm. there's an accumulation of litter in, in these kinds of forests because the litter ends up being difficult to break down. And it ends up being difficult to break down in part because the ectomycorrhizae, mycorrhizal fungi, can retrieve some of the uh, nutrients, especially the nitrogen, out of this litter. And once they do that, it does not break down very quickly anymore. So, so they're sort of like skimming the, um, the icing off the cake. And after they do that, other things are slow to eat the rest of the cake. You end up accumulating pine needles or oak leaves or beech leaves or diptyrocarp leaves or uh, eucalyptus leaves uh, because they're they're sort of already low in nutrient and difficult to break down, but then that's accentuated more by this mycorrhizal interaction. So the EMs have this other biological function where they are still able to derive nutrients, saprobic frosting liquors of the forest floor. So when we see forests with a lot of duff accumulation, we might say this is probably an EM dominated forest. Is that most of the forests we encounter here in North America or is there a pretty even distribution of AM, EM forests? No, it, it ends up being much more common in the temperate zones, especially the, okay. the Northern temperate zones, probably in part because the weather also slows down breakdown of litter. So you get an accumulation right. also because, you know, it's cooler, it's drier. And so it doesn't turn over as fast as, say, a tropical, you know, an equatorial forest or something where, where the litter turnover is really rapid and the nutrient release is rapid. This gets in a little then to the spatial and temporal zonation that you see with these populations. What are some of the determinants in that spatial and temporal zonation you just talked about the weather, the litter turnover. What are some other determinants that kind of decide where these different AM and EM communities set up? Geographic setting is obviously a biggie, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of what we were in because it co-correlates with so many other things, especially the, the climate and, and also the, the geologic history. So, you know, you go to the Southern Hemisphere, you find different fungi than you do in the Northern Hemisphere because they can't disperse across that kind of distance. Right. Uh, and so... At the first cut, I would say the geographic uh, levels determine the community composition. After that, it seems like soil parameters are a huge factor here. And all of the basic mineral nutrients in the soil seem, seem like they correlate and are predictive to some extent of what fungi might be in that forest as ectomycorrhizal fungi. And then I think 
disturbance in local history have a huge mm -hmm. effect on that. So, you know, was this, has this forest been growing undisturbed for hundreds of years? Or has this forest recently experienced fire or a lot or a logging event or wind throw or something that disturbed it? And when that happens, you get quite a turnover when the forest is killed in any way, because the rate at which fungi come back into that, their fate is sort of tied to the tree. You kill the tree, you kill the fungus in most, in most cases. There's a small subset that can hang on as spores and then recolonize after the forest regenerates. And those tend to dominate early forest settings. And then the rest come back in by spores slowly and some very slowly. It may take decades or, or more in some cases for some of these sort of late stage fungi to get back into these systems. As an ecosystem heals, let's say from a forest being destroyed, do we need that process of the mycorrhizal fungi coming back to have a chance of seeing that forest come back, preceding any ability for plant life to kind of reinstantiate themselves? So the systems I am most familiar with in this context would be would be pine forests. Okay. In the case of pine forests, which are really dependent on mycorrhizae, you can't grow a pine forest without mycorrhizal fungi. That experiment has been tried by accident when when pines were moved to the southern hemisphere and they wouldn't establish. Oh, and they didn't have the right mycorrhizal they didn't have fungi. The right fungi. So when the right fungi get there, then they then they take off and grow quite well. So what we know in the case of pines, we know they're very dependent, and we know that when you disturb a pine forest by logging, fire, wind throw, whatever, unless the disturbance is, you know, removes the soil, basically, <laughs> there is almost always enough mycorrhizal inoculum for it to regenerate. But what happens is the species diversity below ground just plummets. So instead of having hundreds of, of different mycorrhizal species per acre or hectare, you might have less than a dozen. And that would persist for, you know, a decade or more sometimes, and very slowly accumulates to a higher level again. And when we're talking about the diversity of these mycorrhizal populations, what effect does an increased amount of diversity have? In my mind, I was thinking, is there one mycorrhizal fungi that could outcompete the others that would learn how to symbiote with different types of plants and become dominant? Is that not the case? You need diversity to have different plants. I guess what is, what is the role of mycorrhizal diversity in an ecological context? That is an excellent question. And like most excellent questions, there is no good answer for it. <laughs> <laughs> it the problem is, is it's quite difficult to study because it's, it's difficult to manipulate the mycorrhizal community and see what it does functionally to the forest. Yeah. But what we know is that quite, quite simple mycorrhizal communities uh, still can produce quite robust forests. And again, we know this primarily from moving things around. So when pines got moved to the southern hemisphere, most of their mycorrhizal fungi did not follow them. There are only a few that got there, and the number has increased over time by accident, mostly. It's still, they're really depauperate in terms of the number of species that are associated with them, and yet the forests grow quite well. If there, if there is an effect with diversity and productivity or resilience of the forest, it plateaus quickly. As you're adding more species, you're not gaining much more in terms of being able to grow a pine forest. Now, whether there's other things that go on, like maybe disease resistance or some, something that, we're, that we haven't really sampled, right. uh, it's certainly possible. But it looks like, you know, you can grow a pine tree, for example, with very few fungi. When you get into the southern hemisphere, they can grow with one. You know, the expanding, literally expanding invasive front of a pine forest in the southern hemisphere is driven by one fungus uh, and that fungus is almost always a suillus so there's a suillus expeditionary forest that lays the groundwork yeah 
And that actually takes us into interesting territory of these mycorrhizal fungi. A lot of the best edibles that we know of today, like the chanterelle, bolete, suillus, are mycorrhizal fungi. So roughly how many mycorrhizal fungi are there? And are they all delicious edibles? Uh, do they all have fruit bodies even? So just a little bit about the landscape of this big universe of mycorrhizal fungi. It's a super diverse ecological strategy. There's, I think the minimum estimate might be like 10,000 species, and, and it's probably many times larger than that. We underestimate it for a number of reasons it would take many podcasts, podcasts yeah. that you might want to <laughs> give to it. But there, there's lots, is the, is the bottom line. Do they all share certain characteristics, or has this mycorrhizal adaptation been used by fungi that are basidiomycetes, ones that don't have fruit bodies? Yeah. Is, is being mycorrhizal more of a trait than a characteristic inherent in the structure or playing a part in necessarily the structure of the final fungal mass? Right. So remember when I was talking about the evolutionary history of mycorrhizae, I mentioned that, they were, that they're amazingly convergent. Like there's 80 independent origins of mycorrhizae on the fungal side. Yeah. So that tells you right away that they don't share a lot in common. In fact, some are ascomycetes and some are basidiomycetes, multiple groups of basidiomycetes. And what you usually think of, you know, the, the sort of casual collector and so on, you think of big mushrooms. Well, a, a lot of them, in fact, the, a lot of the dominants are little crust fungi that hmm. you would never, ever think of as mycorrhizal. They just they look like nothing, and they usually fruit on the bottom of of little pieces of wood or bark or things like, or pine needles, things yeah. like that. And they produce the spores just right there, without without a big showy mushroom. And then <laughs> some of the ascomycetes, a few of them seem to lack sexual spores altogether, although there's some controversy there, and they produce you know these little nuggets in the soil called sclerotia that move when soil gets moved, but they don't uh, move through the air or the water or through animals very well. So that actually kind of answers one of the questions I had here, which was how do EM or AM fungi disperse spores and continually reproduce? Obviously with a fruit body, we know how spores di disperse, we get that, but you're getting at some reproductive systems that aren't that traditional kind of big showy mushroom shooting spores into the air. And one thing I, I was fascinated by in reading your work was actually the role of invertebrate fungivores and how they actually help spread EM fungi. And then even a little more information about how that spore density passes along. So I guess what is that reproductive chain from mycorrhizal fungi dispersing through the food chain? Yeah. And, and is that even common, or is it mostly kind of self-dispersal of spores? Right. So I'm going to back up and answer a question you didn't ask. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and that Lay is the groundwork, how please. Things, how these things established by spore. And, and it turns out that we cannot answer that basic question on the vast majority of mycorrhizal fungi that if you take spores from most mycorrhizal fungi and pour them on to an uncolonized seedling by the bucket load, nothing will happen that you can observe. So for example, chanterelles, Boletus edulis, Matsutake, all of those take their spores, put them on an uncolonized seedling, nothing happens. I asked that out of order then, because that was my next question was how can we all use mycorrhizal fungi to make our own chanterelle patches right. and our own bolete patches. I'm sure people have tried. So we don't know exactly then how spores establish this, this right. mycorrhizal so relationship. We, so we know that they, they have to be involved and they get their, you know, they move around by spore and colonize new areas by spore. But there's some piece of that puzzle that's missing and we can't observe it. So it's a very small subset of species where we can take their spores, add them, and they colonize. And those small subset of species tend to be the ones that show up after disturbance. So if you, you know, have fire or logging or whatnot, 
those species that colonize the tree right afterwards have what I would call reactive spores. That you, you right. can take those spores, put them on uncolonized seedling, and find that they do colonize it. So things like Suillus, Rhizopogon, Lacaria, Thalephora, Hebaloma, what we think of as kind of ruderal species that make use of these disturbed settings to colonize have reactive spores, but the rest don't seem to. Then going back to the, to the example you were talking about, about the sort of dispersal through the food chain of the yeah. microinvertebrates eating spores of tomentella, that's what it was. It was this little crust fungus that you would never pick up in nature <laughs> unless you were obsessed by fungi, right? Right. Uh, but it turns out that the, the tomentella is a major dominant of most of our mycorrhizal communities. If you go below ground and just add up the root tips that are colonized by species A, B, or C, there's almost always a tomentella that's in the top, you know, five species in, in any pine or oak forest uh, in the northern hemisphere that you'd want to sample. In spite of it being little and not <laughs> not obvious, it's a big, big player. And it just makes this little bed of spores that doesn't seem like it could go anywhere. You know, it's just like under a log or something, it's producing a little carpet of spores. And so a postdoc that was in my lab at the time, Eric Lilliskoff, got interested in this. And he was seeing that, that they always had these little mite trails in them where the mites would be chewing along through the sporulating surface. Uh, and when you looked at the mites, they were loaded with spores. Yeah. And so he found that you could take those spores from the dung of the little mites, and it, it would you could get them to germinate and colonize seedlings. And the things that ate the mites would also pass the spores on, still in a viable setting, and things that ate those slightly bigger bugs <laughs> and passed them on. So it, so it sort of get, uh, perpetuated through the uh, what you could call the brown uh, food web. All the little critters that are chewing up the detritus in the forest are probably tracking around spores locally all the time. Now, would those same crust fungi spores not germinate on their own? Was this process of passing through the food chain a key to getting them to germinate? Or was that one example where you could germinate a seedling just with the spores? You can germinate spores of tomentella, uh, this tomentella anyway, on yeah. pine roots, for example. And that was actually why we were first observing it, is that we were trying to do experiments with it. And so mm. we needed to collect spores, and, and uh, Eric was frustrated by that, because every time he'd go to collect them, he'd find, okay, well, these mites have already beaten me to it and eaten a whole bunch of them. Part of that sounds like the hunt for this magic recipe that makes the spores that don't readily colonize activate some property that makes them germinate and colonize a tree. So I guess that is still the frontier of the research with mycorrhizal yeah. fungi is, is what's it, going it, on here. And it probably will be for a while. I mean, there, there was a lot of work in kind of the sixties and seventies by, mm -hmm. uh, Elijah Fries, a Swedish mycologist, was, was doing a lot of this work on, on spore germination and uh, really devoted his life to it, but he only, only came up with you know, maybe a half a dozen that he could get to work. And I'm sure they tried things like heat or some kind of exposure to moisture, all the different natural processes. A lot of the, lot of the obvious things have been tried. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about fungal spore dispersal. So how do patterns of spore dispersal for mycorrhizal fungi affect gene flow, population structure, and overall fungal community structure? At the community level, they certainly affect it in that, again, when there's disturbance or there's new forests uh, setting up, things have to move back in. And they do that at a relatively slow rate. It takes decades for a lot of things to get in. You know, you always think of the astronomical level of spores that are produced, and yet <laughs> it's not enough, right, to get to get all every place that they could colonize. So it works just like dispersal in macroscopic organisms, but at a, a finer scale, and, and the numbers are, are much, much larger. So 
one of the studies we did was out at Point Reyes National Seashore, looking at how many spores move out from a forest edge, yeah, and whether and whether that was sufficient to colonize seedlings out there. So you can just take like a rack of of uncolonized pine seedlings and put them out in the coyote bush, you know, a long way from the pine forest and ask, okay, how many of these get colonized and how long does it take and how does that change with distance? Right. And it turns out that when, when you're within a few meters of the forest border, they all get colonized the first year, no problem. But by the time you're beyond even just a hundred meters, you start, it starts to drop off. And by the time you're about a kilometer from a forest, less than half the seedlings get colonized in that first year. And, and in a setting like, you know, Marin County, where you have this seasonal dry, if they're not colonized that first year, they're not there the second year. You know, it's like, you know, find a fungus or die. Right, um, right. So it really does affect how plants can, especially mycorrhizal dependent plants, can expand from a forest edge. It limits it. And the other thing about that study was that uh, the only fungus that really got out that far was C. Willis. You know, when you're near the forest edge, there's a handful of them that will colonize these. But by the time you get out far enough, it's just one fungus. So C. Willis are kind of these mycorrhizal rock stars in terms of their reactivity and their ability to establish an for environment pine. for pine. For right. Pine. Right. Yeah. So that's been the center of a lot of your studies. I'm actually in Marin County. So I'm very familiar with the places you're talking about uh-huh. with the pine forest you're talking about. So this is directly applicable to, to my life, but have, have you done studies with any other plants or specific forest or plant populations that stand out to you uh, that, that we should know about that might exhibit some of these characteristics or has it been really focused on pine? Well, I I think most of my work has been pine centric (laughs) because for one thing, there's, there's pine forests close by. Sure. And so it makes the field work easier, but they're also really conducive to, to study because they grow relatively rapidly and the mycorrhizae are big and obvious on them. And then there's players on the fungal side that actually behave themselves and germinate and colonize. So they're a pretty ideal population they're, to study in a lot of ways. They're nice. We've we've done a little bit with Doug firs and we've done a little bit with oak and then done a bit with the mycorrhizal parasites, things like pine drops and snow plant and uh, Indian's pipe. And so when you're talking mycorrhizal parasites, what is that family? Are these plants that are parasitizing the mycorrhizae? These are plants that indirectly parasitize the surrounding trees through the shared mycorrhizal link. So they plug into a particular mycorrhizal fungus and instead of giving it sugars, they get the sugars. Wow. So plants parasitizing fungi. Yeah. And so they probably don't have the process of photosynthesis then? Are these the... Correct. They're non-photosynthetic. If you've been up in the Sierras in the yeah. In the spring, you've seen this big, bright red asparagus-like thing that yes. is snow plant. Snow pl- yeah. Snow plant. That's a mycorrhizal parasite. It's connected to uh, Rhizopogon elleni and Arctostaphylae. Uh, so those, those two it'll connect with. That's very typical of a lot of these parasites is that they're very specific on the fungus they pick on. Where the pine tree or fir tree or oak tree would have dozens of mycorrhizal fungi associated with it. Uh, Even single trees would have dozens and over the landscape, there'd be hundreds or thousands. The mycorrhizal parasites are really picky. They just pick on one fungus. That one they've somehow tricked into giving it everything they, they need. These hyper specialized parasitic plants that are, are thieving from our little mycorrhizal fungi That's just an interesting illustration of this idea of community ecology and how these things are playing together. You know, everyone finds their niche somewhere. And again, mycorrhizal fungi are at the heart of it. Another thing I wanted to ask about, I saw in your work, was this mention of microscopic EM fungi propagules. And we may have covered it, but what are these microscopic propagules that that you've done research on? Well, mostly spores. Okay. 
So, so when we say microscopic propagules, we're talking about spores. Spores. The term propagule gets used instead of spore because there are some that are not technically spores. So they can make little knots of hyphae and so on that uh, are sclerotia. Right. And, and those could be formed under the soil and never produced as a fruit body. They also can colonize root tips. So they are propagules. Uh, so propagules is the, the catch-all for spores and sclerotia. Broader, it's a broader category that includes spores. But usually in the mycorrhizal world, ectomycorrhizal world, when we're talking about propagules, it's almost synonymous with spores. And getting at the heart of a lot of the research you do, and as we're talking about these underground webs, potentially dozens of interweaving fungi associating with just one type of tree, when I'm thinking about how you derive any information from this kind of complex ecological web, I noticed that you had done work with the development of molecular tools for identification of these fungi from environmental samples. So how are you able to, to single out certain fungi in this complex underground system to, to do the research? When I first started working on this, I mean, the, the way people identified uh, mycorrhizal fungi below ground was to painstakingly pull off individual root tips and pick them apart under a microscope uh, dissecting microscope and then compound microscope. And if they studied this for years, they could put a generic name on it. They could say, okay, this is Hebaloma or this is Rushla. Or so they'd be peeling the actual fungi root tip off of the tree root individually under a microscope. You take a soil core and you wash off the soil, pull out the individual root tips and look at each one under a, a scope. As you can imagine, if you're doing that, it's slow. And yeah. so your sample sizes were small. You couldn't really go out and ask, okay, who are the fungi below ground in this forest or even under this single tree? Because you couldn't sample enough to do it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, when molecular methods came along, they got applied to this early on. And, and I have to say, we, in my lab, we were some of the first really the first to do it. And when we were first doing it, it too was a slow process because you still had to pull out individual root tips, extract each root tip, and then amplify a particular molecule out of that and use that to tell you what fungus you saw there. Mm -hmm. So between when we pull the root out and we'd actually have an answer would be, months. You know, we'd have two days of field work and six months of lab work to figure out what we saw. <laughs> and then again, the number of samples weren't huge. Uh, and so our resolution of which species were out there and which ones were dominant and so on was embarrassingly bad. It would become a multi-generational process at, at the fastest pace you could imagine when you're having to go yeah. through that. But sort of early part of this century, about what would it have been about 2007 or so, mm -hmm. the high throughput sequence methods came along. You could take just soil, extract the DNA out of that, and sequence everything in it, and then sort that out by computer to look at the fungi you're interested in. So that's the way it's done now. That's the game changer. And was that a technological development? Basically, it had to do with human genome. That the, oh. push, the push to get the human genome sequenced required the development of better sequencing methods or higher throughput sequencing methods. And right. those methods were applicable in multiple areas of research, including mycorrhizal research. And so when those blew into the system, all of a sudden, <laughs> the whole game changed. And... As a result, we, we really have a much better view of, of mycorrhizal communities across the globe because the sampling just went way up. And so only the past 13 years with this high throughput sampling, have we really been able to accelerate our view into this underground ecology of, of mycorrhizal fungi? Correct. We learned a lot with the earlier sequencing methods and, and even non-sequencing molecular methods before that. Yeah, But 
it's quite modest relative to the huge influx of knowledge that has come since high throughput sequence methods have happened. And in general, is this a field of research that is large, small? Is Tom kind of a pioneer out on his lonesome, or is there a pretty big field it's of exploration? A, it's a big community now, or, or a reasonably big community now. You know, when you have a, a meeting of the International Mycological Society, it's, you know, 500, 600 plus people from all over the world. And that's not all of them, right? Those, that's the ones that right. have the money to go to that meeting and the time. And so it's really taken off. I think that's been one of the most exciting things in, in my career is just to see how this field has bloomed. The amount that has been learned over the past three decades is just phenomenal. And I would guess there are takeaways through better understanding mycorrhizal fungi, knowledge you can apply to better protect our environment in the aggregate. There must be ways of figuring out how we develop protections or inculcate maybe the right growing environments for certain fungi. Does it ever get to that level where your takeaways from understanding mycorrhizal networks and how they play into the development or regrowth of forested areas, is there any way to use that to then help this process along in nature to help better restore forests or protect certain ecosystems or, or broaden the diversity of certain plants in an area, if you can somehow establish that mycorrhizal fungi, did those kind of takeaways and applications happen yet? No. <laughs> I would say, you know, certainly we've gained some knowledge on the applied end of mycorrhizae from all this new influx of, of knowledge of who's where and when and yeah and so on but i think relative to our influx of basic knowledge our understanding of applied how we're going to apply this knowledge has still been quite modest in some ways it's just because it's the harder thing to do yeah but looking at at what's in a system and how it functions uh, is always the first step before you can apply that and in some ways i think it's the easier the easier step to just explore and and start to gain an understanding but there's big problems with applying it i mean some of the most obvious things to apply it to would be growing desirable mycorrhizal fungi like boletus edulis for example that's what i'm basically trying to get at is yeah. how can we make our own yeah. delicious gardens of boletus yeah. edulis and yeah. cantorellis and we are still a long way from that right because i think fundamentally what we have to understand to do that is the odd ecology of boletus edulis yes like what is it doing what is it doing differently from from these ten thousand other ectomycorrhizal fungi in the system who are its main competitors how do its spores establish what kinds of uh, soil conditions are conducive to it dominating a system. And in order to have any insight into that, it's probably going to require more and more study of the structure itself before we can start to apply it. But I'm sure I'm not the only one who always thinks about that when I find a big patch of boletes or chanterelles, especially if you have some that aren't perfect, you think, is there some way I can make a spore slurry and pour this around the oak tree in my backyard? But it sounds like the mysteries of the reactivity and why these mycorrhizal spores choose yeah. to develop where they do is still a black box that, that yeah. really needs to be understood before we have a chance yeah. of cultivating our own, yeah. our own fields of edible fungi. One that I've always been curious about, and I've gotten different answers different places, are morel mushrooms or morkella a mycorrhizal fungi? <laughs> You'll get a different answer on that from different people. And the reason that there's uncertainty there is that they form what looks like mycorrhizae on some hosts, but right. the hosts that they form those on are usually non-ectomycorrhizal hosts. Uh, so, so it doesn't make sense. Why would they form with that plant that generally doesn't host right. these? And then some morels also form what look like pathogenic interactions with roots. Mm. You know, what, why some would be pathogenic and others are mycorrhizal is, is kind of weird. And then overall, they seem to fruit 
in abundance when hosts are killed. Yeah. So like in the east, the big the big place to find morels when I was collecting them was uh, when elms were killed by uh, Dutch elm disease. You could find huge fruitings of, of morels uh, the year after the elms died. Here it's fire, right? You yeah. go up into the Sierras after a big rip roaring fire when all the trees are dead and then they fruit. Well, that's quite different from other mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi, usually you kill the host, they're gone. And just intuitively, if you think of the fruiting body as the spore dispersal mechanism, you know, hey, we need to get more spores out and reproduce. Why would they do that when the host dies? Because the spores, if they are truly mycorrhizal, wouldn't have a host to connect with, so it wouldn't do them any good. So that's maybe not so much of a problem because you know a lot of plants do what's called the distress crop of cones or fruit or something that yeah. last year when they're just barely able to live they put all their resource into producing seed because it's sort of their last hurrah to get out before they die mm -hmm. and, so, and so maybe that's what this is with with morels is like okay they know they're out of there so they're taking what they have but the ability to fruit in such abundance says that they have somehow stored or have access to nutrients in this system where their host is now dead. At a minimum, I think you can, you'd can you say that if they are mycorrhizal, they are also reasonably good saprobes, which is an unusual combination. I think people sometimes get the impression that a lot of mycorrhizal fungi, because they retain some saprobic enzymes are also saprobes. There's really no evidence for that in, in most mycorrhizal fungi. Like you can't find rushless, for example, growing where there's no host. You can't find suillus growing where there's no host. Having the legacy enzymes and being a true saprobic fungi, saprobic right. fungi is wildly different. Wildly different, yeah. Now, what would the world look like if we did not have mycorrhizal fungi? <laughs> well, <laughs> if you didn't have ectomycorrhizal fungi, yeah. you'd lose a lot of our characteristic temperate forests. You know, you'd have no pine forests, you'd have no oak forests, you'd have no beech forests, you'd have no eucalyptus, you'd have no pinaceous forests generally. I mean, no spruce, fir, hemlock, all those things. They're all highly dependent on mycorrhizae. So if somehow all my ectomycorrhizae disappeared tomorrow, so would our, most of our temperate forests. And then AM fungi, if you got rid of those, that would take take care of the rest of the plants on the planet, basically. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, we'd be left with a few desert plants, a lot of desert plants are non-mycorrhizal, and some sort of very wasteland kinds of plants that, that come in when there's really severe disturbance a lot of the mustards and things like that can go without mycorrhizae. But it would be a startling change if, if those were not with us. Since the crustaceous period and before, plants have come to rely on fungi, at least on this planet, for their livelihood. Yeah. And I've heard tales of prototaxites and other early slime molds or fungus on the planet. In your opinion, is it likely the case that we needed some kind of fungi here to create the environment for plants and other life forms to grow? Well, that is the predominant view now is that land plants basically colonized land with fungi. Yeah. The, the very earliest land plants have evidence of fungal colonization that looks like our AM mycorrhizal fungi. And all of the plants have the symbiotic genes necessary for this. So the colonization of the land was not an easy thing for what were probably marine or freshwater plants to do. You know, it was a stressful environment. Uh, yeah. and, and instead of being bathed in a nutrient broth, uh, you have to find those nutrients in, in the soil. And so probably very little soil. <laughs> um, <laughs> From the get-go, fungi and plants have had this partnership, and it's probably just based on the ability to specialize on, on a particular way to extract nutrients out that 
if plants were going to do that, they'd have to have much, much finer roots than right. they currently have. And they would also have to have an enzymatic capacity, retain an enzymatic capacity that they don't now retain. We cannot overstate the importance of mycorrhizal fungi and the way things have developed. We wouldn't have almost any of the current plants we have now. And it really gives you a window into this massive world underground and how important it is. And this specific topic is definitely one of the most inspiring to me. And when I first got into mushrooms, it's that one that really opens the door to making you realize how integral fungi are. I mean, saprophytic fungi are useful and obviously in decaying dead things, we'd be buried in detritus. But to then think there's also this interconnection that all these other living things rely on, it just gives you that that window into how truly important fungi are to our ecology. And this kind of leads me into just a quick discussion of the current research you're doing. I know uh, from reading your website, you're doing more work with saprophytic fungi. What's going on in the current research there in the lab? Currently, most, mostly I've given up mycorrhizal fungi now, and I've moved on to post-fire saprobes. Very relevant where we are in the Bay Area. Yeah, I sort of got driven there by my uh, research sites burning up. but uh, <laughs> and, and by the fact that um, so many of my students were trained to work on mycorrhizal fungi, and they are all doing great things. And I just feel like the need in that area is less than it was a few years ago. I'm not sure I'm competitive with some of them anymore. Like, they're, they're really good at what they do, and, and uh, I'm happy to have them do it. So, so I moved on to working with uh, post-fire saprobes, and I like that because they're so much easier to deal with. It's a much smaller group. They grow well in culture. They grow really fast in culture, and you can set up simple experimental systems to sort of pick apart what they do and how they do it, how they interact. It's more amenable to experimentation, I would say. And are these keystones in helping systems bounce back after fire? Are these the keys in helping things be able to, to grow again in that area or helping that ecology bounce back? Possibly, but I would say it's not clear yet. What we know is that there are some of the first things back. They are back in a matter of, of a week or two after... Wow after the fire burns they just boom they take over the whole system and in doing that they probably help retain nutrients in these systems so they don't leach out right. uh, so i think from that aspect they're probably really important they may do some other important things like affect the way carbon recycles post fire and they may turn over these hydrophobic soils that happen post fire that usually when fires burn in pine or eucalyptus forests in particular, they create a hydrophobic soil that doesn't absorb water well. And as a result, water runs along the surface until it finds a place to break through and then causes erosion. Yeah. And so usually when fire recovery teams are trying to figure out what to do in forest settings, they'll put out uh, grasses or they'll put out grass mats and so on to to reduce erosion, but it's because of these hydrophobic soils. And usually they assess the area by, by assessing how hydrophobic the soils have gotten and how widespread that is. I think that the turnover of hydrophobic soils is likely a microbial process. And the first microbes on the scene are, are these post-fire uh, soil fungi. That's sort of my pie in the sky application is that I'm hoping to find the ones that that actually turn over the hydrophobic soil and then understand what it takes to encourage their growth post fire. Right. So there are some windows into applied uses of these fungi to restore fire stricken areas or post fire areas. Both the mycorrhizae we've been talking about, the current fungi you're researching as we develop a better understanding and get some kind of framework to even understand their applied usage, do you see an introduction of the applied use of these fungi or maybe just the understanding into our current environmental protection framework? You know, when you talk about environmental assessment surveys, and when you talk about environmental restoration, do you think 
understanding of these fungal relationships is currently missing and could enhance our efforts there? Yeah, I, I would say that generally when we're when we're looking at health of ecosystems and and regenerating them and so on, the, the fungi don't get a lot of attention right. and are likely critical in these. And so getting a better understanding of how they interact with each other and, and what kinds of conditions you need to create for them to prosper and which ones you want to get to prosper, <laughs> all those sorts of things uh, have the potential to, to have application. When you're talking about all this, it's something I hope that environmental scientists and policymakers, when you think of an organization like the EPA, I hope this knowledge can get integrated into how they build legislative frameworks, you know, environmental guidelines. I think that's going to be the next key step in pushing forward environmental protections to, to the next level. Now, I saw a news article about another superstar from your lab, Catherine Adams, uh, just in the news a few days ago. Oh, really? It's this one. Yeah, so it was talking about lateral flow immunoassay oh, and her okay. work with detecting lethal toxins in mushrooms, namely the infamous Amanita phylloides or death cap. So just a quick little bit about her work. I know we're kind of diverging from what we just were talking about, but oh, it's a quick a, little it's bit about micro, Catherine. It's an ectomycorrhizal fungus. <laughs> well, we're right in line then. Perfect. Yeah, as all the Amanitas are. So it actually goes back to your earlier question of whether they're all big edibles and so on. No, a lot of them are big poisonous ones. Too. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole range. There's a whole range. So she's been quite interested in Ammonia phylloides from a number of aspects. And the work you're talking about, she teamed up with someone in the USDA, uh, Candace, to um, get a, a rapid assay for the toxins. You know, when somebody's poisoned or something, you you know that it's this fungus that got them <laughs> right. or a fungus that contains this particular toxin that got them. And that's important because now there's basically an antidote to the toxin now. And if you get it to them soon enough, the chance of recovery goes way, way up. So that's key is having an early warning system or the quickest possible yeah. response system. Yeah. Because oftentimes when somebody's poisoned by a mushroom, there's not a lot of evidence of what mushroom it was that poisoned them right because they didn't save any or they didn't yeah. know what they, usually they didn't know what they were doing to begin with and that's how they got poisoned and then if they didn't save a piece you don't know actually what they ate and there's some mushrooms that a lot of mushrooms that would poison you but it's not deadly and so the you might not need to worry much but the initial symptoms could be quite similar mm. they could be vomiting and feeling awful Death cap in particular, I know, can often hide symptoms for certain periods. Yeah, well, there's a lag period. Yeah. So that's really important. Well, I just wanted to give a shout out to Catherine. I was reading that article and it just happenstance was your lab. So I had to bring it up. And that's obviously really important and great work, especially here in the Bay Area, that every mushroom season, there's the inevitable article about death cap mushrooms. So thank you, Catherine, for making it a little bit safer for all of us. Uh, so we can we can register these things faster. If you can hint at it at all, I know we just talked about your current post-fire fungi research. Any plans for future research or future plans for uh, yourself that you want to talk about? I think I'd leave it there. I, other than to say that I do see retirement in my future. You know, I think I, I will be moving out of sort of active academic research more and more in part because, as I said at the beginning, there's many of my students now that are quite good at it. And uh, I think the need for my special set of expertise is less than it was <laughs> a few years ago. And you could always move into that burgeoning realm of citizen science, which I know yeah. you already do host citizen mycology groups yeah. in your lab. We would be lucky to have your skill set and huge amount of knowledge contributed to the, the amateur and citizen mycology community? No, I think, I think the citizen science edge of mycology is really impressive. And I'm very happy to be involved with that in any way I can. Although uh, even there, I think, I think my input there is not necessary. <laughs> like it seems like there's <laughs> enough momentum that's moving forward, but necessary or not, it's, it's fun to be involved with it. And I love to interact with such groups.
mycology in particular just stands out as because it is so frontier kind of bleeding edge new science that it stands out as this area where amateur mycologists can really have an impact because there are just as we've hinted at through this whole conversation there are just so many things to explore and not enough man hours to even look at it all so the more citizen mycologists you have the faster you get to explore all these different directions in mycology and that was my window into it so i was reading about you hosting different groups and i i just love to see the academic world blend in with that world because that's really how we're going to make the most progress is putting everyone's talent to use and i'm sure there's some citizen mycologists out there that can always use inspiration and direction from someone yeah. with your level of uh, yeah. expertise and then people transition from one from one group to the other, right? The, the, yeah. citizen, the young citizen scientist of today is the professional scientist of tomorrow. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. If, if all works out the way it should, anything else that you wanna cover, anything else you feel like is relevant? I know we've covered a lot of information, but is there anything else you wanna mention before we wrap up? As long as we're on citizen science, I would just, I would just say that it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here in the Bay Area where there is so, so much mm -hmm. interest in mycology amongst the citizens here. People are interested in, and not just from a what can we eat perspective, <laughs> although that's certainly part of it, but people seem genuinely, they don't seem, they are genuinely interested in the basic biology of fungi, and it's great to see that. It's absolutely exploding into the cultural consciousness right now, and the Bay Area definitely is a hotbed. That's why I feel so fortunate to be here, and I am just one symptom of the Bay Area yeah. wave. You're so, so are we about. both. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we're going to do the, the Mushroom Hour final quick hits. Some questions I ask all my guests to give us even better insight into Tom's spirit or who Tom is. What is a mushroom that you love and why? And this can be any mushroom. doesn't have to be a favorite. Maybe it's just a really interesting, cool one you thought we've never heard of. But what's a mushroom you love or we should know about and why? I think I'm always enamored by any mushroom that I haven't seen for a long time, and then it pops up in some setting I'm not expecting it in. And there's a long list of such fungi, so I don't, I don't really have a favorite, I would say. I, they all fascinate me, but when I haven't seen one for a long time and I see it again for the first time, I'm like, ah. You love the surprise of old friends. Yeah. Old fungal friends. I like that. I like that. And then what would you tell to an 18 year old Tom? What would be some advice or what would you tell to, to an 18 year old Tom? If it was me specifically, I wouldn't try because at that age, you know, I wasn't listening to anybody. <laughs> but <laughs> but if, if there was a more general- A general 18 year old then, yeah. And they were interested in fungi, I'd say by all means, stick with it. It's a wide open field. There's a lot of, area, a lot of areas in in the study of fungi to work on and you know if you're interested stick with it there's a place in it for you yeah and then the lasting impact that you hope to make with your body of work the lasting impact you hope to have i think training of students one of my colleagues uh here john taylor once made the comment that you know whatever you do in science you know if it's a big breakthrough or whatever it's really six months ahead of your competitors. That's all it is. That, <laughs> that almost everything you find, think of, or do, somebody will eventually find, think of, or do. We can say we're pushing the field forward, but it's a modest push relative to the sort of collective creativity. But I think the real impact is in training of others to continue the work. If you inspire a student and they go on and train five more students, you know, then it's a multiplier. Then it, then it really has a, a significant impact that, you know, I, I couldn't make by myself and, and no one would make by themselves. You know, getting others inspired and interested and trained is probably the, the best I can hope for of my long-term impact. And when you talk about that goal of we want to feel like we're pushing the, the field forward as well, that's really the way you do it is pushing a next generation to build on what you've learned get inspired themselves in different directions and then grow 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 out from there by spreading mycology and teaching all these amazing people who do their own research 
that is the biggest impact you could have in, in pushing the field forward. So Tom, thank you so much for taking the time, being willing to be with us here today. I did not know you before this podcast and you are an absolute joy to talk to and just a great guy to have on with so much knowledge. So thank you. Thank you again for being a part of this. It's a pleasure. And maybe sometime we'll actually meet in the flesh.